Kyle was in the middle of taking a test at school when he suddenly got a bloody nose that would not stop. This caused him to get rushed to the ER, and it was there when he heard his mom mention to one of the doctors that he had 22Q. He looked up at her and asked what that meant, and she said, that's a genetic disorder that you have. Today, I am so honored to introduce you to Kyle, who is an extremely optimistic person and also an extremely creative person that creates beats. So I am honored to introduce you to Kyle. Hello, and welcome to the 22Q podcast. My name is Becky White, and today I am so thrilled to have Kyle on with us. Kyle, how are you? Please introduce yourself. I'm good. Um, uh, my name is Kyle. Uh, I have a 22Q and um, it's been quite an interesting journey. Nice. Well, we are thrilled to have you on. And I first was introduced to you through Instagram. I found you and all of your beats that you create. Tell me, what is your number one love? Is it music? Uh, yes, but I also dabble in uh, exoplanetary science. I'm also, I'm a part of the uh, group called Exoplanet Watch. And they they also help uh, find mainly exoplanets and also that kind of stuff as well. So I dabble a little bit in that as well. Nice. So, Tell me a little bit more about that. What is that exactly? I, I'm new to it. So basically what we do is we are looking for exoplanets based off of data from the uh, satellite that's up in orbit right now. We are basically getting what's known as light curves. And basically what uh, light curves allow us to observe is dips in starlight. Like if you see like a curve, like from a light source, it'll just like, like completely be blocked. And that's what we're looking for to be able to find the planet. So that's what we do. That's really cool. How long have you been into that? It's been about five years. I started off not having really any knowledge on that. And then uh, I have a couple of mentors that are helping me. And then uh, I also have more people from the whole uh, astronomer society and uh, the whole thing that uh, come together and uh, help people that are, you know, in interested in learning all this type of stuff. It's, it's definitely a good hobby to get into. Yeah. So has space and astronomy always been a really big interest of yours? Yeah, I remember back in, um, I think it was 2007, uh, my uh, grandfather uh, sent me a photo of the uh, space shuttle launch from his backyard. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's been since then, yeah. Would you say that your grandfather sort of led you towards astronomy? Uh, yeah, planets? yeah. yeah. Uh, if it wasn't for him, yeah, I guess, yeah. That's great. My son also loves space and astronomy. So tell me about your love for music. You are extremely talented. Tell me about that. Yeah, I've uh, started about uh, 10 years ago. Actually, it was kind of funny how I started it out. I started it out because uh, I was going through a dark period in time. I was dealing with my um, thing 22Q wise because of the uh, trips to the hospital left and right. And um, I needed something to do that was keep going to keep me not bored for eight hours just sitting there. So I found a program. I uh, got a chance to download it. And I eventually bought it like two, like four years back. And um, I've been doing this ever since. Nice. And what's the name of the program that you downloaded? Uh, it's, it's called FO Studio. It's a digital audio workstation. Uh, same thing as like Ableton and uh, Logic Pro. Mm -hmm. And it helps you create beats and yeah. music, correct? Can you explain it a little bit more for those of us that aren't, aren't familiar yeah. with it? It's, it's uh, kind of not really a complicated process. I mean, start off with blank screen, nothing. And then like after something like 30 to an hour, depending on how it sounds and everything, and then you take it to the final for mixing and all that stuff. That's where it gets a little interesting and difficult because uh, I'm not particularly great at mixing because of my hearing loss. Good, It's a good outlet to get into. And I recommend it to anybody that are trying to at least learn some sort of form of audio production. Yeah. And, uh, and is this something that you just stumbled upon? Is this, is there someone yeah. in your life that also was doing this at the time? Uh, yeah, I uh, stumbled upon it and um, I kind of gradually grew into it. It kind of started becoming more and more than just a hobby. I actually started making sales with uh, music uh, beats and stuff like that. And uh, I kind of noticed that. And then I started uh, network, just building my fan base, trying to interact with people, meeting new people. You know, that's basically, I'm just doing it for the love of interacting with you know, new people and all that kind of stuff, you know, hearing their stuff and, you know, getting more ideas and collaborating and yeah. So does it allow you to collaborate on the platform? Yeah, it allows you. Yeah. Instagram is a great place for like the platform to collaborate with other producers, um, like a producers, artists, 
musicians like uh uh if i'm not mistaken for like movies and stuff like that practically the go-to place to meet practically everybody there that's great and uh yeah it's definitely it's worth it what's a goal of yours or is this is this a passion of yours or is this something you hope will become a career path for you uh, right now, I'm hoping um, it should be, become a career because uh, uh, right now, judging by how I'm doing by this year from last year, I mean, I'm, I started noticing that it's starting to gradually grow over time. Yeah, I'm honestly hoping that might become like sort of a career that started off as a hobby. Yeah. Right. So you produce beats. Is that yeah. really like the technical term for it? Yeah, that's the technical. We're also sometimes called artists, but technically the correct term is producing. So yeah, produce. And where does your inspiration come from? Do you just think of a beat and then just build and build onto it? How does your have, process work? I hear like melodies in my head, like right now, like I'm hearing like a lot of stuff are in my head right now, like melody wise. Basically, I'm able to like uh, incorporate whatever I hear. Uh, they, I also have producers send me loops and I am able to build off based off of what they sent me and yeah, it's been, it's been like that son. Yeah. So you just get this vision or you hear, or you start on one thing and then just continue to build on it. Do you get inspiration from anything? Uh, yeah. I listen to other producers, uh, that have different, well, I call it mixed styles and I have like, uh, like arrangements and everything because, uh, as a producer, I like to take like other producers, uh, like not not work and kind of use it to get myself an idea of what I want to do for original stuff and uh, like uh, hearing how they're original then on top of that I also not incorporate the, their sound but I make my own sound as well just being original I guess is all I really care about so yeah yeah you, you're extremely talented I was listening to some of them last night and they're really good where can people find you where can people listen and possibly buy some of your beats there's a site called beat stars I'm actually uh partnered with called beatstars.com and uh, it's, uh, it's actually on the link in my profile on Instagram. Uh, they could just click my name, show up my beat store. I haven't uploaded in a while. I completely forgot to update my catalog, but uh, yeah, they, they could find it there. Nice. And what is your Instagram handle? Uh, my Instagram handle is at Lynn Beat. Nice. And we'll put it in the description of this podcast so people can click on it and check it out. So, cause they can hear all the stuff you're creating, which is fabulous. So please, if you don't mind, just introduce yourself and where you live, what, where you work and a little bit about your family. I'm originally from New York. I recently just moved down to Florida a couple of years back. Try, kind of changed the scenery in small town syndrome. <laughs> I used to work at a place called Sonic. I was a cook there. I started out as a uh, uh, filling out drinks and stuff like that. And then I got uh, moved to the kitchen, started cooking there. And, uh, I've, yeah, they were really good people. And, uh, my family, um, family wise, uh, I tried interact with them more uh, we're so like spread out it's it's all over I try to like uh, keep in touch with practically all of them and are they still in New York yeah a lot of, most of the majority of them are in New York but we have people in Oregon we have people in Texas we have people wow. in North Carolina we have um uh, I can't remember but uh, all over have, yeah we have practically yeah everywhere and do you have any siblings uh no thank god no <laughs> thank goodness <laughs> nice. So only child. And right now, exclusively, are you working at Sonic now? Uh, no, I stopped working around August due to medical concerns. So they uh, uh, had me put in my two weeks notice. And uh, then uh, I got the thing from my doctor saying I couldn't work. So yeah, it was kind of a bummer, but they were a pretty good team. Good, good. And please share yeah. with us your 22Q journey when it started, when you first realized you had 22Q. Yeah, uh, actually, it actually started the day I was born. Uh, they noticed that I, a hole in my heart, they corrected it and uh, they uh, basically fixed it. The scar healed up my school years later. They found out I was uh, hard of hearing because uh, they were having, uh, I guess, difficulty trying to like talk to me and like uh, get, get me to have their attention. They uh, got tested and they found out that I was completely deaf on my right ear. And then they found out that I only had like 50% hearing left on my left ear. Then I was uh, also struggling with chronic ITP as well at the time. And uh, the chronic ITP, I had to have infusions when I was a kid too. And um, what is ITP? 
it is a tongue twister to pronounce it. Immune, tra- immune thrombocytopenia purpura, basically what it does is uh, it's, um, a bleeding disorder that affects the platelets. Okay. And so basically when your platelets are really low, you're at a risk of severe bleeding, um, bruising, broken blood vessels, bloody noses, and you're required to have certain treatment like IVIG. And um, sometimes they don't like to go this route, but they re- uh, do rounds of retux to uh, push the uh, platelets to boost them up higher. And um, treatments when I was a teenager were brutal um, for retux and um, IVIG. I remember the first day I actually was fully diagnosed with chronic ITP. When we went to the ER, they took me out of school due to a severe blood and nose. Uh, and I was in the middle of an exam, so yay. <laughs> I got escorted to the nurse and the nurse says like, yeah, go to the hospital ASAP. <laughs> and wow. they uh, looked at my legs. They looked at my arms, my chest, my, my neck, everything was covered. And oh, um, no. they, they, we went to the ER, the ER is like, you're getting admitted to the hospital right now. <laughs> they administered IVIG. That was the first time I had IVIG and it was for about eight hours and they let us go home after two days. Mm -hmm. Uh, after improvement with the platelet count then I guess they dropped again the next week and then I guess they pushed another round and then another round and then another round and then I think after four rounds of IVIG that year uh it was good um for platelet wise and then four years later it came back Mm. and then uh that's when they pushed retux and then instead of doing it once uh every three months they were doing it uh once every week for her talks, it was aggressive, but it, it, it helped. Yeah. It, and then now I'm on a, um, I'm on a pill for it, for, um, uh, chronic ITP and, uh, it helps, but unfortunately it lost efficiency. Oh no. And, uh, we're looking at alternatives. So, uh, that's the only thing that, uh, I'm struggling with 22 Q wise that could actually cause, you know, significant damage mm-hmm. is, uh, the chronic ITP. And what are some of the risks with ITP that you could bleed out? Is that, am yes. I correct? Yep. Bleed yeah. out. And, um, you can also internal bleeding, uh, stomach area, uh, I guess spleen. Yep. Um, and, uh, then there's also, uh, the risk of, uh, having uh, no platelets, uh, which is actually cause for concern because I actually came close to that. Um, when, um, your platelets are really critical, it increases your risk to like have all these internal, like bleeding and bleeding in the brain. They basically monitor everything. Yeah. I mean, struggling with it. I mean, it's just the overwhelming exhaustion is that's about the only thing that I struggle with, Mm -hmm. uh, from that, just a lack of energy. And then, yeah, that's practically about it. Mm -hmm. It sounds emotionally exhausting too. Eh, it can be, uh, it's how most days, uh, most days I'll wake up, uh, I'll wake up exhausted and I'll try to wash my face to like like, pour water on my face. Even that doesn't have anything. I hate relying on caffeine. Yeah. I don't like relying on caffeine. It's just not really great for it going out and trying to do stuff and actually uh, like uh, vacuuming, like just house chores in general is a struggle because when I'm vacuuming and or just dishes in general, I'll have a wave of exhaustion just hit me out of nowhere. And it'll just like have me completely like plop down almost just the overwhelming exhaustion. Right. Have you ever been able to connect with anyone else that has yeah. ITP and kind of get suggestions or support? Yeah. There's this group on Facebook. They've been super helpful. They uh, let me know uh, what they did uh, when they had chronic ITP. I guess, uh, Certain fruits I've been trying to include, uh, I guess it's for vitamin B12, I guess, um, for energy wise, they supposedly help because uh, I like blackberries, kiwi. I can't do apples, unfortunately. It's just uh, like certain fruits that I'm trying to include and um, I'm trying to eat more, not like just meat in general, but also like protein, like uh, trying to include, include more protein and see if that might do anything. And I haven't seen any like improvement on that. This protein, uh, yeah, is protein typically something that might help? Protein, yeah, it gives me a little bit of energy, but at the same time, it's not, it, it doesn't seem to have any effect. 
Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, I've I've started noticing because I started experimenting with my diet, and I tried in uh, like a, like more vegetables. Uh, I tried eating corn, and I tried eating potatoes, more greens a little bit. I've tried. Uh, doesn't really seem to have any effect, which is odd. And I mean, mm-hmm. it, I I kind I kind of expected it. Mm-hmm. That's a lot. Yeah, That's a lot on your plate. Is there any sort of long term diagnosis with it? Was this something you're gonna have the rest of your oh, life, yeah. or could it go oh, yeah. away? I mean, mm-hmm. technically it could, but uh, uh, unfortunately for me, it's chronic and I'm going to have this until the day I die. So, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, uh, that's the only thing that, uh, that that affects me. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, hang in there. That's a lot for one person. And uh, it sounds like you found a good support on Facebook and at least can get some ideas maybe or suggestions through them other than your ITP. What other things from your 22Q do you deal with? Um, I deal with heart problems. There will be days where I have random heart palps and I'm going for a walk or just doing stuff in general. I'll feel like a whoosh, like, and then it's just like, I also deal with uh, vision changes. I also deal with uh, sudden headaches and I also do with neck issues. Uh, currently, as we're talking, I'm uh, having like the same thing yet, uh, I guess. And also my teeth. Uh, my teeth are also decaying uh, from demineralization uh, mm-hmm. from uh, 22Q. And mm-hmm. my knees have also degraded too because uh, the first time I actually ended up nearly dislocating my knee. And that was when they found out about the, the they, I guess were de- my bones were starting to demineralize a little bit. Um, trying to go on walks and trying to, I guess, try to be more active to, you know, counteract it. So Mm -hmm. try to help it. Mm -hmm. And And what uh, do you do to? Yeah, I try. I try to sometimes I I try to do push-ups, but I also try to do walking. I at least try to get a mile and a half to two miles in because uh, I also have flat feet and it it hurts some days to like walk. Yeah. It's like, I mean, it's, going pretty well I mean I able to like go certain distances without having the need to stop to like uh you know need a like a drink or anything or just to stop and just like for my whole body Mm -hmm. um I mean managing it for to counteract it I mean yeah I try to do my best yeah it sounds like you are it sounds like you're doing a great job how do you feel about your 22q uh it's been a life-changing uh experience uh Mm -hmm. both for better and for worse at the same time because they're still finding new things about me that i i haven't been diagnosed yet as a kid it's interesting to learn about that and uh figuring out what i could do to manage it's it's a it's been an interesting experience yeah right and when did you first learn of your 22q diagnosis um uh, when we were, I guess the, that was be when we were first at the ER for my uh, platelet drops, uh, when mm-hmm. my platelet dropped. And uh, they told me um, that, our, my mother told them that I have 22Q and I'm like, what's that? They're like, oh, it's a genetic disorder. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> right. And how old were you? I think I was 13. Uh, 13. I think I was 13, 12, uh, roughly around that age. Um, yeah. And what your first reaction, you're like, what is that? And then when you started yeah. to learn a little bit more about it, what did you uh, think? My first reaction, I didn't seem phased at it because I didn't know at the time what it was and what it can do until I started learning more about it. And I actually grew an interest in learning about it because learning about it uh, opened my eyes up a little bit, um, you know, because interacting with other people that have it and not a lot of people because I have a person, um, I honestly think it was in Florida, uh, down here that I also have this. And I also have people up in New York that also have this as well. And, um, I talked to one of my friends that, uh, also have it and, uh, uh, like hearing their experiences and all that stuff, uh, like, uh, it made me understand more about the, what it can do and all that kind of stuff. But I, I just had no idea. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was, it's, it's definitely an interesting learning experience. Yeah. Cause there's so much, right? Yeah. A lot. Just that one piece of chromosome is like, it could do, it could do a whole lot. It could do right. a whole lot. Right. I know. And what have you found 
that has been helpful for you as you've been trying to navigate your 22 Q what's been helpful? Um, just trying to be outside more, trying to interact, uh, cause, uh, social anxiety is also a struggle as well, because, uh, then just trying to interact more. I've been trying to let people know that to let them know that I'm deaf and stuff like that, to let them know that I have this as well before, cause, uh, they, they're completely fine with it. Uh, and, uh, which is awesome that, uh, uh, cause, uh, I've interacted. That's uh, my workplace was uh, awesome. Like with that type of stuff, they were they helped me through, especially with the difficulties when I was working there too. And, That's great. Uh, and how has your hearing loss and deafness been for you? Uh, equilibrium issues, wobbly, disorienting, and it's just like every morning when I wake up, I'm disoriented. Like I like wobble, and then either I almost fall. Like I, I could tilt my head right now, like right now it's like heavy. Like I could feel the, like the whole pressure from like that side where I'm completely deaf and it's uh, like a whole, like just the equilibrium, not being able to hear properly. Um, then on top of that, it's like trying to control my volume. I can't hear myself. And it's, a, that's the difficult por- portion of uh, that is uh, not being able to hear myself. Right. And, uh, adjust my volume according to, uh, I have to have my friends or family tell me if I'm being too loud or anything to let me know to, you know, quiet down mm-hmm. and, uh, or else that will happen. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that helps you navigate your deafness? Navigating? No, not necessarily. I've tried hearing aids and I've lost so many in the past that I've, I just said, screw it. I'm not doing it. It costs too much. And I just didn't want to have that pressure put on my parents because they were paying for it. And I didn't, I understood that because I didn't want them to go broke because of me, because of the hearing aids yeah, and all that. So we decided to leave the hearing aids. I'm hoping by next year or so uh, we're going to try like getting myself fit for one uh, for the audiologist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, um, speech wise, it's affected me quite a bit like slurring. Um, it doesn't feel like a stutter, but it's like a more like a repeat. Yeah. Like for like a, two or three times. And my friends have to let me know that I'm doing that. And I'm like, I think you're doing a great job. (laughs) Yeah. They have to let me know. Cause, uh, like when, um, my speech starts acting up, um, my father actually started noticing that recently with my speech. And he's like, you do realize you're slurring. Right. And I'm like, I, no, I haven't realized. Yeah. And yeah, part of the brain or something. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure either, but I think you sound great. (laughs) How was school for you? What was that like? Um, school was decent. Um, I definitely made some friends, but during toward high school, middle school, I was kind of falling back because uh, now I was dealing with chronic ITP. That was the first year that I was dealing with it. For my freshman year was my first year that I uh, was dealing with it. And when I had to go through treatment, my teachers would actually Zoom call me when I was in the hospital to help me. Uh, with some of the stuff because I wanted to like finish the work like I was wanting to like still continue it and all that stuff and uh, it was decent until um, sophomore and junior year I and that was when I had to start doing the rounds of Ritux. Dealing with that it was it was it was brutal. Uh, Ritux is strong. <laughs> um, yeah. Like, like just dealing with the overwhelming nausea after the uh, treatment and all that, to, like during school, uh, like I ended up spending most of my days at the nurse's office because of how bad it got. And uh, the, I, they still try to find time to like help me work on the, more of the work, which was awesome. Right. Um, like they were like, con- they were, they were very considerate. And for our audience, can you describe what it was like getting that treatment and what you felt like after that treatment? Uh, when they have, they had to dose me up on Benadryl because the treatment can cause really bad headaches. Some days I was so loopy. <laughs> the first day I received the uh, retux, it was honestly funny because not, it was not necessarily funny in a good way, but funny to me because uh, I, uh, the nurse is like, can you say your ABCs? And I was like, A, B, and then I just like completely passed out oh, no. <laughs> and um after like three or four hours of treatment I was I woke up and my mom's like 
we're done. And I'm like, wow, that was fast. <laughs> wow. How was I out? She, she was like, you were out for a good while. You were out for like four hours. <laughs> wow. And I'm like, she's mm-hmm. like, how do you feel? And I'm like, I have a pretty bad headache. <laughs> yeah. And um, she's like, yeah, you'll feel that. And then um, I, w- I went home. I was so, I don't, I was dizzy. Um, so like dizzy, I, yeah, I headache. Was dizzy. I was like trying to walk to the car. My mom had to like, hold on to me to like I was she's like are you feeling all right and I'm like yeah just dizzy and I uh, yeah. went to the car I sat down and as soon as the car started uh moving I started feeling the sensation I'm like oh yep yeah. and then as soon as we got home instantly yeah. and it was bad and then um yeah then uh, after the next day I started having muscle issues like my muscles were um I had a muscle spasm the next day Mm-hmm. And turns out they uh, had a higher flow rate on the um, uh, medicine. They were trying to get me out uh, earlier so that I didn't have to stay around for eight hours, and uh, which I was glad they did. But at the same time, it caused muscle spasms from hell. So it was like uh, uh, trying to adjust from the muscle spasms and uh, all that stuff. And and how long uh, did that last? Oh, for like two days. Um, oh no! I, I was I was in bed for like. I was in bed for a day and then I, I tried getting up the next day and my mom's like, don't even try. And I'm like, I'm trying. I need to walk it off. Mm-hmm. So I walked it off. I was able to make it toward the uh, kitchen and like try to at least make myself some food and stuff like that. And I couldn't barely eat Yeah. because of the treatment, the way it affected my metabolism. So how did you deal with all that and then continue school? How you push through? Um, I actually graduated. Uh, there's one teacher that understood what I was going through. He kept pushing and uh, he didn't want what me What was to his name? Uh, his name was Mr. Sassone. Um, I've had him since I was in junior high or no, junior, uh, uh, no, not junior high. Since I was a sophomore, correction. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, he understood my condition and uh, you know, he was working it out. And uh, like he understood when I was having these episodes from the uh, treatment, he understood and he basically excused me to like, you know, you know, from it. And, um, you know, it was, uh, cause, uh, coming back and then finishing up the work after. And, and I asked him uh, if I could stay, uh, uh, after for like an hour or two to finish up some of the stuff because I wanted to, he's like, yeah, sure. Go for it. And, uh, so I stayed for like an hour and a half. I was able to finish it. And then, uh, that was uh, then during the senior year, I unfortunately had to have another round. Then they did the thing and uh, I was able to I was still graduate uh, that year. Wow. Um, like uh, teacher wise, they were very, they, they, they understood what I was going through. And um, it was awesome that uh, I, I had a few teachers that understood and quite a few others that didn't understand because when um, I had to leave class, I, I had to leave my uh, government class, uh, you know, because of the issues that I was having. And um, uh, after a few months, he I understood that I was going through something. And he, he's like, he confronted me. He's like, I just want to let you know, I understand what you're going through. He's like, he's like, what do you mean? And, I'm, and he's like, you know, your issues. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, thank you. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Good. I'm glad that your teachers saw you with compassion and also allowed you to do what you needed to do in order to graduate. That's great. And what do you think is the biggest struggle for you navigating your 22Q? Managing properly, figuring out the, like uh, what to do to manage it properly. Cause uh, the chronic ITP from the heart issues to the uh, sensory issues with the vision just trying to find an over, just a good balance overall. Um, trying to find a good balance to, to help me navigate my way. And uh, cause as an adult, it's uh, difficult. And uh, right now uh, we're applying because uh, financial, it's a problem because uh, we've been applying for all kinds of stuff for, uh, to see if I get some sort of financial help uh, for the appointments because the appointments are draining me from, uh, uh, you know, just managing my 22Q, just finding best practices to manage it. I mean, like, uh, whether it's uh, anxiety management, just listen to music and whatnot, and then I'll go for walks. And yeah, mm-hmm. that's about it. 
for walks. So going for walks and listening to music, what else helps you with your anxiety? I also play a bit of, I've been playing piano for a while. I've been playing for about uh, 10, 11 years. Wow. Um, and That's um, amazing. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, 22, 22Q actually started affecting the way I played the piano because of the hands and joint issues. And uh, so, yeah, um, I had to step that down for a little bit because of it. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. You seem extremely optimistic and positive. And I know you did mention that you did have some darker times and what those dark times were like and how you were able to overcome them. Yeah, when um, the ones, uh, I think it was their school most of the time after having a round of treatment and having to go to school the next day, just the nausea, it was bad. And, uh, and also it's uh, just, dealing with uh, the overwhelming exhaustion after the treatments because they also had an effect on my, uh, the way I felt like energy wise too. I tried managing the best I could. Struggling with it uh, like last year's, I had I had a chronic ITP episode that I actually almost ended up with zero platelets. Wow. And that was when I got on the pill. We're still struggling with it to this day. And also the sudden headaches now are starting to become a problem. Now I'm also having chest issues but I'm still walking. I'm still trying to, trying to see if I could uh, like get through that. I also fought COVID twice, was able to navigate that. And uh, actually it was not that bad. Um, Good. Just managing the best way I try to can is mm -hmm. uh, what I've been trying to do. It sounds like you're doing a great job. And I think it's really wonderful that you're willing to share that you've been through dark times. I feel that on this journey of 22Q, but even just being human, we all face dark times. And I really appreciate you sharing that with our audience, because I feel that there are many individuals living with 22Q that do go through dark times, but it's important oh, yeah. to know that you're there not alone in that. I think you have a really good positive outlook on life and you've been through a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just wanted to ask you too, if you had an opportunity to just stand on stage and announce to the world something about 22Q that you want everyone to know about 22Q, what would that be? Research first what 22Q is because people overlook it. They think uh, they don't know a lot about it. And uh, that's, the, that's the biggest thing is just research because even my um, father is still trying to understand as well. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle. And uh, like a lot of people, including some of my family members, don't understand because uh, they don't have it. Uh, but they understood what I was going through and I was going through the uh, treatments and all that stuff. And um, for people, I would recommend like doing their research um, because you'll learn a lot. Um, just the basics of 22Q, like I said, it's a multi-system genetic disorder because uh, that way they have a better understanding. And um, yeah. Yeah. Do your research, learn about it. And I think you're a great advocate for it. I know you've posted a few short videos on your Instagram page about it, just educating others, which I think is great. And I think that's how it's going to get out there more. Yeah. Having lived with this as a 23 year old and gone through the ups and downs, what advice would you give others that are listening that have 22 Q? My advice is, uh, when you're going through, um, like, uh, dark time try to find ways to manage it and uh try to um just struggling to keep positive i know it's, it's a struggle to keep positive and it's just my advice would be to find an outlet like uh whether it's music or just something you enjoy doing or just like to keep you busy for the time being it'll keep you distracted from practically all the other stuff that is uh going on and uh whether it's uh, 20, like your, like your whole thing that you're dealing with or other problems and, you know, it'll help like majorly. Mm -hmm. And I need uh, that outlet. Yeah. Great advice. And do you have a quote or anything that you live by that keeps you going? If you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> Cliche quote, but yeah. Yeah. I love it. That's yeah. so good. And what keeps you going? Uh, I guess just the music, um, figuring out what lies ahead next year, because uh, uh, we had some interesting times these past few years. Yeah. Just, yeah. Music. 
huge outlet for you. That's awesome. And you're so talented. So keep it up. And I'm so happy that I can possibly connect you with other people. And for anybody listening, check out his Instagram and some of his beats are incredible. So check them out. And is there anything else you want to add before we end here? I think that about covers it. Yeah. All right. Well, Kyle, it was a pleasure, my friend. Kyle, thank you for being on the episode today. You are such a brave and strong person. And I just want to say, keep going. Your creative outlet of making music is incredible. And you inspire me. And for our listeners, I have one of his beats at the end of this episode, so you can check out his amazing work. And for anyone that is interested in reaching me, asking me questions, or even possibly being on this podcast, you can get in touch with me at 22qpodcast at gmail.com. And never forget, 22Q family, that you are not alone.